today, I want us to consider Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6 and 7. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, that is where we will premise our sharing this evening. My Bible has these words. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now the title of this message is Shalom, my friends. Shalom, my friends. That is the title of this message, Shalom, my friends. There are times in the Bible when heaven poses to sort out people who believe in him. The book of Philippians is one of the few books in the Bible that is addressed to Christians, believers, community of singers and worshippers. The times that God poses just to sort out his people first. And the book of Philippians is one of Paul's pastoral letters that he addressed to the believers at Philippi. And he was writing to thank them for their help in his hour of need. But while thanking them for their help in his hour of need, Paul took advantage of that letter to send along some instructions on Christian unity. And Paul admonished the church in Philippi to understand that only in Christ, only in Christ, are real unity and joy possible. He encouraged the church to use Christ as their model of humility and service. He told the church that they can only enjoy oneness of purpose, oneness of attitude, and oneness of goal only if they attach their ministries with Christ. This is a message for our time. Music being a high calling must be approached with a great sense of unity of purpose, with a great sense of oneness of attitude, always bearing in mind that God and God alone is the object and subject of our ministry. Philippi was a city, not a person. And I want you to get this background a lot more clearly. Philippi was a city northwards from the city of Rome. It used to be a very pagan city. In the city of Philippi, people believed in the plurality of gods. They would worship idols. There was um, a sense in which sex had been idolized and worshipped as God in the city of Philippi. But when the young man Paul got the opportunity to stand at the center of Philippi, he lifted the cross of Christ. He reminded the Philippians that burdens can only be lifted at Calvary. And he told them that there are things that God alone can fix in their lives. This message touched them. There was a great sense of revival in the town of Philippi. The people of Philippi burnt up their idols. And they accepted 
Christ and him crucified. Paul took them to the waters of baptism and he planted a church in that city, the church of Philippi. But I am amazed with our world that such a great revival was not taken kindly by the Roman authorities. You know, there are people who rejoice whenever they see tears in the faces of their friends. I read a passage in the Bible where a young lady was possessed. She was being tormented by the powers of darkness. And one day she followed after Paul and Silas, shouting to the public that, Behold, these are true servants of God. That happened in Ephesus. The Bible says Paul got bored up. And Paul turned and rebuked the devil out of the young lady. And the young lady was free at last. But that act of deliverance was not taken kindly by the public. As a result, Paul and Silas were rounded up beaten and taken into the prison. What saved them from the prison was the power of divine music and prayer. So there are times that your tears could be my joy. The fact that you are not able to sort your issues with your husband, someone is celebrating that. The fact that you have issues with your boss and you are uh, stopped from work, someone is celebrating that that is this life. So the mighty revival in the city of Philip did not please the Roman authorities. So they looked for Paul, rounded, it, rounded him up and placed him under house arrest. Paul was not arrested alone. He was arrested together with his spiritual son called Timothy. News reached the church in Philippi that their pastor Paul is under house arrest. They were so bitter and they decided to go and see Paul in prison. They collected a few gifts and they went. When they got to where Paul was imprisoned, the authorities told the believers that not all of you are able to go and see Paul. They were sent back, but they were told that they can nominate one of them, give him whatever gift they have, take it to Paul through that one person. So it is recorded in history that the believers in Philippi nominated an elder called Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus picked these belongings, walked into the cell where Paul was, found Paul subjected to a lot of brutal treatment. It is said that while in prison, Paul would be given 39 strokes five times every day. So there were marks of beatings all over his body. When, when, when Epaphroditus looked at Paul and saw his, his pale body, when he saw the marks of beating all over his body, when he saw the tired body of Paul, he remembered the life of Paul when he was still serving in the Pharisaic council. He remembered Paul as a mighty young man, a scholar with a great power of intellect, a man who walked with the company of bodyguards. Because of Christianity, he is now rotting in jail. Epaphroditus in tears looked at Paul straight in his eyes 
and told him, Paul, is this the cause of Christianity? Has life come to this Paul? Do you really deserve all this? It is said that while Epaphroditus was pitting Paul, another couple came called Priscilla and Aquila to comfort Paul. And when they saw the wounds and the chains and the beatings all over, the marks of pain all over the body of Paul, they were touched. But Paul in chains looked back at them and asked them, Epaphroditus, Priscilla, Aquila, what is it that can separate me from the love of God? Is it chains? Is it death? Is it beatings? And Paul went ahead to answer his own question. And told them that nay, not death, nor chains, nor beatings, nor hostility, nothing whatsoever will separate me from the love of God. That is the covenant every choir member has to make tonight. Every one of us must ask a solemn question. What is it that will separate you from the love of your God? As a pastor, I come face to face with people who are very active in choirs. But today, they are passive. Some of them are no longer coming to church. And you, when you ask their reasons, they tell you so and so blackmailed me. So and so insulted me. So and so accused me falsely. I'm not saying those treatments are fair. No, they are not. But as painful as you may feel, you must reconsider why are you in the choir in the first place. If your presence in the church is out of your inner conviction of the need to uphold the service of God, you will look at that gossiper. You will tell him or her, let me be. You do not know my story with Christ. I will serve my God. You will not care. Busy bodies who never rest until they blackmail their own brethren will no longer matter for you. Paul kept on reminding the church that I, Paul, I am an apostle not because some person somewhere preached for me. I am an apostle because Christ alone called me by name. By name. So Paul encouraged them. The couple together with uh, Epaphroditus. And Paul asked Epaphroditus about the condition of the church. Epaphroditus told Paul that, Paul, it is not easy. The choir you started is failing. Some people are going back into their pagan religion. The church is not doing so well. And so Paul picked a pen and wrote a letter to the church in Philippi encouraging them to hold on. It is that letter written by Paul in prison that is called in our Bible today the book of Philippi. It is a prison letter. Now, Paul says a lot of things in the book of Philippi. But when you get to Philippi chapter 4 verse 6, Paul is telling the church in Philippi that, friends, be anxious for nothing. 
But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. He's asking the church, until when will you quit? Until when will you hold grudges amongst you? Until when will you weep and be bitter in spirit? Until when? All your tears, all your frustrations, all your conflicts, all your issues, all the wounds in your heart, don't you think you need to put them together and take them to the Lord in prayer? That is the counsel of Paul to the believers in Philippi. I was reading a book authored by, I don't remember his name, but he was a behavioral psychologist. This uh, psychologist was saying in that book, the book is called A Sound Mind. I recommend it to you. He was observing that 92% of our frustrations, 92% of our stressors, 92% of what has denied you peace and joy, 92% of those things that are wearing you down today are all in the past. 92%. That which is making you hate someone with passion. That is making you to vow that so and so I hate and hate and hate with passion. Do you know that that which is causing that hatred is in the past? It had happened. I witnessed a very sad scenario one day. When a member of a choir was blessed with the gift of a baby boy, and she carried her three month old baby to church, it was one of the camp meetings. The church was full. Now, in the process of following the message, the young kid started crying. And the mother, the, mother, the mother took the baby, akaanza kumnyonyesha. And as the baby was sucking, there was a church member in that church who was believed to be having evil eye. So when she passed by, looked at this child, suspiciously and in a matter of minutes the, the body of the boy this toddler's body started turning pale his eyelids mm, turned into some yellowish color and within, the, within no minutes the mother in fear and out of confusion, rushed her three-month-old baby to the hospital. When they got past the gate of the hospital, the boy succumbed. So this lady was telling me that, Pastor, since that happened, whenever I walk out of my door and see the grave of my son, I can hardly take it. She told me that, Pastor, that explains why I have never been to church for five years now. Do you know, as, as painful as that experience may sound, it is not sufficient justification to cut your relationship with God. It's not. It is nowhere near the pain and frustration that God saw at the sight of his only son 
naked on Calvary's tree. It's not comparable. Take it to the Lord in prayer. And the Bible says in verse 7 that the result of taking our issues to the Lord in prayer will be an experience of the peace of God. Paul says that this peace of God surpasses all understanding. Now this word translated as peace of God in the Hebrew language it is called shalom. And shalom, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds as you stay in Christ Jesus. I need to tell you something about the peace of God, lest you misunderstand this text. The peace of God, and this is why Paul describes it as a, a brand of peace that surpasses human understanding. Shalom, which is the peace of God, is not the absence of challenges of life. In any case, this apostle talking about the peace of God is in chains at the time he is putting his pen to paper. So shalom is not about the absence of life's challenges and frustrations. When I was doing a study about the word shalom, I learned that the first time the word shalom is used in the Bible was in the book of Genesis chapter 15 verse 15. And let me read it for you quickly. This is the first time the word shalom is used in the Hebrew Bible. And it is exciting that it was used by God himself to Abraham. God tells Abraham that, and as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, in shalom. You shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. Did you know that at this hour, when God is assuring Abraham of his peace, Abraham is over 100 and is still childless. At this hour, Abraham is still a, pre a pilgrim with nowhere he can point and call home. But God is telling Abraham that in your pilgrimage, in your homelessness, in your landlessness, in your childlessness, in your condition and circumstance, Abraham, you can still have an experience of my peace. Because shalom is not the absence of challenges of life. Shalom is that realization that your God is still bigger than your frustrations. It is that, it is that resilience that which keeps you going. That which makes you say it is well with my soul. Even when my very marriage is breaking before my eyes. It is well with my soul. Because my destiny is in the hand of God. That is the peace of God. It is what kept Paul going in prison. He told them it is not about chains. At this time it is said that Paul already had a, de a date with death. He had been sentenced to death. And he's telling the church that to me, dying is a non-issue. If I die, I die in Christ. If I live, I live for Christ. I know how to live in want. And how to live in plenty, it does not matter. Because my frustrations today cannot be compared to the glory that is waiting for me in eternity. That is shalom, the peace of God. It is shalom that kept Joseph going. 
when he was facing enormous sibling rivalry, his own brothers wanted him dead. His own people wanted to eliminate him. He was tagged and called a, a dreamer. He was dropped into an abyss to die. It is the peace of God that kept Joseph going. It is shalom that kept Hannah going. It is shalom that gave Hannah the courage to walk into the temple early in the morning. It is shalom that gave her the courage to face the altar, which was not a very usual thing for women in the Hebrew culture. How would a woman go to the, to the holy place? It is shalom that kept Hannah going. It is shalom that made Hannah contain herself. When the priest thought that she is, uh, she is drunk, and Hannah looked at the pastor, the priest Eli, and told her, man of God, I am not drunk. I am just broken. I have come to plead with my God and pour the contents of my heart to him. It is shalom that gave the three Hebrew boys strength to face the king. Because shalom is not the absence of our challenges. Shalom is the realization that yes, even in the midst of our challenges, God can still intervene and turn around the tables in our favor. Shalom can make you stand with your two feet as an orphan. Shalom can make you vow that even though I am parentless, although I have been orphaned at a very early age, I have a father in heaven who will take care of my destinies. That is shalom. And so as we come almost to the end of our week on music emphasis. I want to wish all of us shalom. Shalom is not the absence of challenges of life, I repeat. It is the realization that in those very challenges, we have a faithful father in heaven who will sort you out. It is the realization that we serve a God who can go with you even into the abyss like Joseph. A God who can walk with you into the fiery furnace like the three blue boys. A God who can walk with you even into the confines of your chains and prisons. Let me plead with someone in this audience who is almost quitting. Someone who has not forgiven another person. Is there someone you hate with passion? Is there a wound you are nursing in your heart this after this tonight? Is there something that you just can't let go? It is weighing you down. You stopped singing in the choir because of that. So much so that every time you kneel to pray, you feel like your prayers are hitting the sailing and coming to you. Is there something robbing you of your peace? Have you tried also temptation? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Heaven has sent me this evening to plead with you and to remind you 
that burdens are lifted at Calvary. Until when will you entertain bitterness? Until when? Until when will you be considering revenge? Until when? Until when will you stop greeting your brother? Until when? Take it to the Lord in prayer. The result of that will be an experience of the peace of God. This message is dedicated to all singers who may have been discouraged in the course of their calling. Stand up again. Let go and let God. And may God bless us in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you for the power in your word. We thank you for your peace which we badly need. Like Paul, we have found ourselves in situations that has robbed us of our peace and joy. So much so that at some point, we have considered quitting and giving up. Some of us who are very devoted in your cause, some of us who are very committed in the choirs, until life threw battles on our way, and we were bogged down, and today, Heavenly Father, we are not sure if we can stand again. So I pray that if there is anyone in this audience, Father, if there is any soul watching from far and near who is nursing any wound in his heart, I pray in the abundance of your glory, supply such a person with a special brand of peace. A peace that surpasses all understanding. Wipe that tear. Fix that broken life. Revive that dream. Restore that marriage. Help him to stand again. May this counsel that was given by Paul to the church more than 2,000 years ago inspire us tonight. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.